What began as a micro school in 1967 for, for Clonlara School founder Pat Montgomery's two children and six others has grown into an internationally renowned K-12 private school serving 2,000 off-campus students around the world and a small group of on-campus students at its Ann Arbor, Michigan headquarters. Dissatisfied with the prevailing schooling options, Dr. Montgomery decided to create her own school for her own children that would encourage childhood creativity and curiosity without coercion. Inspired by A.S. Neal, the founder of the famed self-directed Summerhill School in England, Montgomery built Clonlara as an alternative to traditional schooling. It quickly became clear that parents outside of Ann Arbor were attracted to this learning model, particularly as the modern homeschooling movement gained traction beginning in the 1970s. One Michigan family was charged with truancy for homeschooling their children using Clonlara. So Montgomery mounted a lawsuit on behalf of the family against the Michigan State Board of Education. 30 years ago this month, on May 25th, 1993, the Michigan Supreme Court ruled in favor of the family securing homeschooling rights in the state. Today, I am so honored to be joined by Pat Montgomery and her daughter, Chandra Montgomery Nickel, who was Clonlara's first student, served as its longtime executive director, and is now Clonlara's board chairperson. Pat and Chandra, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. Thank you so much. Thank I'm so glad you're today. here. I'm so glad you're here, particularly this month on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of securing homeschooling rights in the state of Michigan. Uh, well, I definitely want to get into that story and how that came to be. Um, but let's maybe start at the beginning. Um, Pat, you were uh, studying to be a nun. You were thinking that that was the path that you were going to go down. And then in your 20s, realized that that wasn't sort of the path for you, that you uh, had a different life uh, vision and goal. And so you left the, um, be, the training for being a nun and ended up working in various Catholic schools and public schools and sort of seeing uh, education at the classroom level and realizing that this wasn't quite what you wanted for your own children. So then you kind of went down the path of creating Clonlara. I'd love to hear what you were seeing at that time and what was missing in conventional education. Well, I actually backing way back there, um, I, I did become a nun. I became um, a professed nun, which is the highest uh, step in the order. And it was at that point that I determined that I could probably do this work without wearing this habit and without being a part of an organization of religious women. And that's when I left the order and Three years later, I married Jim Montgomery, Chandra's and her brother's father. And we started Clonlar School because at one point I thought to myself, well, in five short years, she'll be going to school. And that was so gripping that I just couldn't wait to discuss this with Jim after work that day. And when he came home, I was ready. And we determined that since really there wasn't anything, there was a Montessori school in town, but it was way out in the country. And we visited and it wasn't quite left enough. Um, so, we determined we're just going to have to start our own. So that's how that began. And Chandra, what do you remember about those early days at Clonlara and kind of your childhood in this um, very child-centered learning environment? I remember it was absolutely wonderful. It it was, 
everybody there wanted to be there. We wanted to go to school. We wanted to see what was going to happen next. One of the things I remember from outside of Clonara, I mean, here we had this wonderful place that we enjoyed so much, but from outside, we'd get the odd stare. Oh, that school on Jewett, that's not really a school, is it? You know, the kids just play all day. And all of the what you can find now in, in what is what is now research and scientific data says that's actually a really good thing that we were playing all day as three year olds, four year olds, five year olds, you know. Um, so it, it was a good place. And I'm really proud to be not only a proponent of of that kind of education, but a product of it, because, you know, I mean, there's more and more products of it now, but. Um, we put up with a few slings and arrows, those of us who who ventured, and I'm sure she had way more slings and arrows as a professional than I did as a, as a child. So tell us a little bit more about that time period, right? Because the 1960s, especially the late 1960s, was a time of the free school movement. There were a lot of child-centered, more progressive alternative schools that were sprouting across the U.S., most ended up disappearing after a few years when sort of that countercultural fad um, faded, but Clonlara and some others sustain were sustained. What was happening uh, kind of in the broader culture that might have influenced your decision to start Clonlara, Pat? Well, actually, it was that simple that I had been an educator for so long um, both in the religious order and then in the public schools and other non-public schools. And I didn't think that anywhere I taught um, was a, a proper atmosphere for children. Their opinions were not respected. They were never sought. They were never asked when there would be changes made, even like hiring or firing teachers. These are people that work with those teachers intimately, more than any other adult does, but they were never consulted. And I thought that was just upside down and sideways and it oughtn't to prevail. And yet it did. And so people, as you said, there was a growing movement uh, to investigate that and to change that and to make it more child oriented. And, and so that's that was the background. And you talk a lot about kind of the origin story of Clonlara uh, and um, sort of the subsequent decades since starting it in your book, The School That's Inside You, that you wrote in 2017 uh, at the 50th anniversary of Clonlara's founding and kind of talking about. Um, the fact that so many conventional schools were coercive, were kind of focused on curriculum-driven top-down education, and you saw a much more child-centered model. Um, and it is great to see that there's a resurgence of interest in that, I think, um, especially over the last few years, but even over this uh, this century of just more and more pa parents and educators demanding something different for their children's education. So I want to talk a little bit now about kind of those early years of Clonlara, especially into the, the kind of next decade of the 1970s uh, and 80s, when you had your private school, Clonlara, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but more and more families were attracted to your model and yet didn't necessarily live close to Clonlara, so couldn't send their kids to, um, to the brick and mortar school. And so you were versatile and you uh, enabled them to sort of learn remotely at home and this kind of off-campus correspondence program. And that's what ultimately led to uh, this lawsuit um, that you were involved with, with a family that was a, a they had a student who was enrolled in Clonlara as an off-campus student, um, but had uh, the truancy officer essentially coming after this family as illegal homeschoolers. Tell us what was happening there with that family. Well, actually, I hadn't ever thought of doing any other kind of schooling except having a small school on our campus about a mile from where we're sitting now. And until a family came and spent the day and I asked them after they had viewed everything and interviewed the teachers and me, uh, when were they planning to move to Ann Arbor? Because they were from the other side of Michigan. 
the west side. And they said, oh, they're not moving. They just want to be involved from a distance. I said, well, I never, never thought about that. I never heard about doing such a thing. But what would you need? And they told me what they would need and that they had no access to any books or materials because they were simply parents. And companies, textbook companies, refused to deal with parents in those days. And so um, that's what they needed. And so we just set that whole thing up. And I assumed that it would be a one-off, that, that that's an unusual situation and we could handle that, no problem. And it, it was the, how do you say that? The dog, the, the tail that took, took over the dog or something. Well, it opened the floodgates is what I would say. Okay. It opened the floodgates. <laughs> 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 and so um, I saw that um, people would say, I never heard of that. And I'd say, I didn't either until we did it, you know, <laughs> that's how you hear of it. And so that became a running joke, you know, of how we did what we did. And then they would say, well, didn't you have to go through a lot of red tape? None whatsoever. If you have a thought, you just do it. And if anybody differs with it, they'll come and knock at your door. And nobody ever knocked at our door. I, in fact, um, I don't even remember what was my first, I, yes, I do, yes, I do, yes, I do. I went to um, the Department of Education and met with the superintendent to tell him what I was doing, because I thought th this is his arena. This is where any questions are going to be directed, not to me, but to the superintendent, what's going on in Ann Arbor. And so I took the brochure, well, I, I didn't, I actually just went. And the one gentleman from the department worked closely with the superintendent said, you're not thinking of starting a program or anything, are you? And I thought, what a capital idea. You know, that's what I got. Oh, thank you. So that's how I got the idea to start a program from the horse's mouth. And when I did, that's when I went back with the brochures and everything to sh show what I was doing. So no one ever questioned it. No one said, well, you can't do this. Even the people in the departments would say, we've never heard of this. I said, neither did I. You know, it's new. So that was the origin. That was how simple it was to just start this thing and then have it grow even to overseas where over half of our enrollment comes from now. Just amazing. So what happened with that family um, that sort of triggered the lawsuit? Can you tell us about that case? Yes, they went through the lawsuit, uh, appeared before the judge, and the judge said there was nothing wrong with what we were doing. The, the law says that a child should get an education, and obviously this child was getting an education. And at that point, I think the assumption was since they were involved with the school. And um, when the judge determined, well, let's, let's just dismiss this case and let things go as they're going because there's, there's nothing wrong here, uh, nothing to see here. And that was it. Sandra, I wonder if you can add some more context to that story because you had mentioned. Yeah, it's that. not as simple as. Yeah. <laughs> There's more to it. Not so as tell simple us. as it sounds. <laughs> I think there's some rose colored, you know, glasses looking at it now. Um, so there, there was more than one family that was being poorly treated by the state. So, um, you know, she went in and she showed them what she was doing. Well, that doesn't mean they liked it. Um, you know, when they have a certified teacher in front of them or they have an administrator or someone who runs a private school, they have to give them more due than they would give a parent. But I think one of the places my mom was coming from was I was a parent. I educated my own children. These people should be able to do that. And dang it, I'm going to stand up for them. And as as an aside, 
study after study after study, statistics show that parents who educate their children do at least as good a job as professional teachers. Uh, I love professional teachers. It's not a, a dig. I am not one and, you know, I, I need them around me. Um, but it does not mean their certifications do not mean that a parent can't teach their own child. And I think that really dug into my mother in a way, because again, she started a school for her children. And so when parents were being told, oh no, you're not following the rules correctly. You know, there's nothing in this law that says what there are no law at the time. There were no laws about homeschooling in the state of Michigan. The law said, and don't quote me that I have it exact, but basically that a child should go to school or be otherwise educated. And so, you know, there was nothing, no details that said what exactly otherwise education was. So the, the school department, the Department of Education decided on their own what education is. And it's 180 days a year and it's so many hours a day and it's um, keeping attendance. You must keep attendance. So parents were keeping attendance records you know, for children, for their home-based children. Um, and they must have access with a certified teacher. And the lawsuit was to say, that's not true. That's not a law. That is a regulation that is concocted for parents who are outside the purview of the Department of Education. The Department of Education can set their own rules for schools, even in some cases for private schools, um, but they can't they can't regulate parents who are not part of that system. And that was the lawsuit. I think that's where the great indignance came. Not only are these parents you know, qualified and able in their own right as parents, you, Department of Education, can't enforce your rules against them. Only the legislature can bring those rules. And that's what the judge decided was true. Yeah, Chandra, and I wonder if you can just add also um, the context about that case where it could have been a way to protect a family that was enrolled in Clonlara, or it could have been more expansive. Tell us about uh, what your mom did. Well, that's a little known fact that um, I didn't know about until probably a few years ago, um, but I always suspected it, that um, at the end when the judge was finishing the decision, he spoke to my mother privately and said, would you like this decision to apply only to Clonlara students or to all parents, you know, in the state of Michigan, which was his jurisdiction? And she said, all, of course, all, you know, that that it should not only apply to Clonlara students. And so um, that's that's why it changed precedence in in the state of Michigan and then you know, obviously throughout the country as precedent's decision. Um, and it was pure altruism on her part because Clamara covered the costs and and the work of, of, of filing that lawsuit. Um, my mom compiled briefs because we couldn't afford to pay, you know, uh, lawyers and paralegals to do that. And she put those together and cross-referenced them and indexed them. And, and we still have them. <laughs> 30 years later, they're still in a, you know, bucket in the back of the, you know, the school in a storage room. It's pretty amazing to see. Well, thank you for that work of securing homeschooling rights, making it easier for homeschooling parents, elevating parents' role in the education of their children, and really uh, paving the way for additional education entrepreneurs, school founders to find their own path, especially around child-centered education. You know, you were a pioneer in creating uh one of these first micro schools, and that's obviously been sustained now for over 50 years, and also a pioneer in securing homeschooling rights. So just so grateful for all of your work. And so the the court case, the, the decision came down in May of 1993. This was almost 25 years into running Clonlara. And then for the next 25, Chandra, that was when you really started to take a more active role in the school and thinking about... Yes. Um, the future sustainability of Clonlara, finding opportunities, um, seizing those opportunities. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experience uh, as the school's executive director. 
Oh, well, um, before I became the executive director, my mom actually um, formed an advisory board or a committee, a transition team, um, because she had seen so many of these schools go under, not make it, usually because of you know, finances, because they certainly had a lot of vision and a lot of, of will to, to exist. But finances are tough for any school. As we know, public schools have bake sales. You know, um, we don't, we as, as, as a country don't support our schools the way we should. And we definitely don't support private schools. That's a totally different discussion. Um, but we had to figure out what is going to make Clonlara sustainable into the future. And I was part of that advisory board. Um, and after I think at least 18 months, two years of, of this board, where we looked at every aspect of the school, the campus school, there was a student, by the way, on the, on the advisory board as well, a student, a parent, staff members, uh, and other advisors who looked at every aspect of the school, the campus school, the, we called it the home-based program at the time it's now off campus. Um, at the buildings, you know, at the at, and at the finances, and we looked at it all and said, "How are we going to protect this? And how are we going to carry it into the future when um, Mom Pat retires?" Uh, although we didn't say the R word, she transitioned out as director. And so, how are we going to make sure it didn't fall apart? We read books by William Bridges and Peter Senge that said what happens to organizations when the founder leaves, or you know, or when they don't prepare for the future. Uh, and it after these two years of this or whatever, we kind of all looked around at each other, and I thought, what, what we have is is an amazing vision that if we bring somebody in to carry the vision forward. They probably won't pay enough attention to sort of the, the, the systems of it and the finances of it, which were in need. And um, that if we brought somebody in for the financial aspect of it or the systems aspect, they probably wouldn't have whatever it is that takes to have a vision, whatever it takes to be so dedicated that for 38 years, you do not take a salary from the organization um and that that ended i i promise you i took a small salary <laughs> because i thought that's a false economy you know and there were things like that that we needed to change nobody is going to come in and do this for free after you know after the founder leaves and and that's huge that's true of a lot of nonprofits not just schools but particularly schools when you deal with children and they bring happiness and joy into your life every day when they come in the door you just don't feel like you can you know, sort of endanger that by spending a little extra money or, you know, paying teachers more. Um, and so those are the things that I thought were really important to look at um, because we could, you know, I could step in as executive director uh, and I, if I were like my mom, then somebody's going to have to replace me, you know, and it can't be that it can't be based on one person. Um, and so I did, I, I didn't necessarily know what I was doing. It's not like I did this five times before with other businesses and, you know, I would just step in, but I, that was my dedication where her dedication was to students and parents and, and the educational process. I thought we have the educational process. What we don't have is it sort of systemized so that it will happen again and again and again, every time. And it, that sounds like easy. Oh, well, we'll just systemize it. It, no, it took it took near 17 years <laughs> to, to look in every nook and cranny and say what's necessary. One of the things that was necessary was a really we had a great work culture. So how did we make sure that that lasted? How do we how do we, you know, ingrain this culture of trust into our organization? Um, and so those were the steps of things I did. How do we ingrain decision making? And we say that staff. Um, has their own discretion, has discretion to make decisions. But obviously they don't have 100% discretion to make whatever decision they want. How do they know? How do people know? If you tell them, use your own discretion, how do they know the boundaries? And so those are the things that I spent years working on. And, and in some cases, like, like she did with the school and with the home-based program, um, it wasn't out there. I couldn't just Google it. You know, I mean, I could Google what is discretion, but I couldn't Google where's a document that tells a staff member how to make a good decision. And so those were the things that I created. I had to, you know, I had to learn by doing. And I always thought I was creating something out of nothing. You know, <laughs> and, and once it's there, once it exists, it seems so easy. 
Um, but it, but it, it was a labor of love as well. Um, and so to have been able to actually retire from that a year ago and know that it, it's, it's sustainable now. It is. It's consistent. The people are basing their decisions off of the work that I and the leadership team did um, to create the culture and the, and the processes. This is really heartwarming. Well, I had a chance to visit uh, the Ann Arbor Glenlara location earlier this month, meet some of your staff, see the beautiful space that you've been in since the 1990s. Uh, and it does seem like it's well positioned to go uh, many more decades uh, ahead. Right. Again, thanks to your leadership and the solid foundation, uh, incredible staff, including former students uh, who have come yes. back to help uh, be a part of that process. And as you mentioned, kind of adding in these operations and um, you know, communicating more about your educational philosophy and approach. But I think the other thing that's really fascinating about Clonlara is your global reach and the fact that you were really pioneers on uh, online learning and distance learning before that became so mainstream. Um, obviously, you had your correspondence program, the off-campus program or home-based program, as it was called in the early days, and then that evolved into now your online program which is where most of your Clemara students come from uh, and certainly has a spectacular reputation um, across the country Excellent. and around the world. So how does that program work? I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the online program, especially for parents that might be listening and thinking about education options for their children. Uh, what does that involve? So one of the things that we've done is, is kind of hybridize this idea of online education. I think when most people think of online education, they really think of, I just sit at the computer and fill out the tests and I read the information and I watch videos on the computer to learn. And that's not what we wanted. Um, you can do that. If, the, if that speaks to you, it, I think there's there's a tiny percent of people who actually finish online courses. And it it may be increasing these days because they've made you know some bells and whistles. Um, but if it appeals to you to sit at the computer and just log in, do the work, you know, then then fine, you you can do that. But what we've done is try to to mesh it with this idea of self-directed education of um students choosing their own topics or choosing their own resources. Um, choosing how they're going to learn it. Are they going to, you know, are they going to do some quizzes online and pick some of their own resources or are they, you know, are they going to compile everything themselves and then tell us what they've done? Um, there, there are so many different ways to, to build your own education using our online program. Um, we have online teachers. They will help you with the course material. We will give you a, you know, we will give you a curriculum if you want to follow that. Let's say you've bought, you know, a curriculum for for a for an advanced high school math course because you know you just don't have the resources in your area. You have no idea how to how to approach trigonometry, um, and so you think, well, this is the one I'll just sit down and do. But you get halfway through it, and and the the teacher or somebody else or you has given you an idea or or one sprung up inside of you and said, you know what, I think I could do a project. I could do a project with. Um, sort of maybe origami with kids. And, and I'd like to add that as part of my learning process. And we're all about it. What, you know, let's do that. How can we make it better? How can we um, ensure that what you're getting out of that is, is appropriate for the course level, you know, and, and subject that you're working on. And we want kids to be doing more creativity in that. And so it can come, you know, it doesn't have to be pre-planned. You know, you don't have to tell us in September that in November, you're going to do something creative. <laughs> you know, it can be, you followed the path through to November and you thought all of a sudden, oh, I see a different way I could finish this off. We want you to do that. Um, and, and so that's what we've tried to do is just create this way um, to add to the to the standard process of learning the standard idea of what is a course so i want to ask you both about the future of alternative education especially learner centered models like clonlara and i'll start with you chandra do you see interest continuing to grow in models like Clinlara that do focus on self-directed learning that are um, you know focused on non-coercion and interest-based education? Uh, you know, where do you see that going? 
I definitely see it increasing. And even just during the pandemic, um, watching the news and schools were closed and kids were totally bored by, by what was a, a chaotic situation. I mean, we had Zoom, that therefore we could have classes online, but nobody was prepared. Even Palmyra wasn't prepared for what to do with our campus students on online every day. You know, um, we did create something that we think is great and we're building on that. But um, so parents would be interviewed on the news. What, are, you know, your kid can't go to school. And they'd be like, look what he did. He built this rocket ship or she did this project on Cleopatra and she you know, design clothing and, and a whole costume. And the parents were so proud of the kids. And what I want, you know, I wanted to call the news every time and say, we do that every day at Clamara. You know, we do that every day. And I I I know that that education will continue to move towards this model because it, there's really truth in this model. What we need to learn, what we need to be creative, confident humans is autonomy. We must have autonomy. We must be able to make our own choices, which is like she said, like my mom said, what she based Clamara on. Kids having their own choice, their own say in things. It doesn't have to be everything every day, but they have to have some say. I want to study Cleopatra instead of Greek myths or, you know, whatever little thing. There's there's as much learning in, in and maybe there's more learning in what we choose to follow. And if we can have schools and teachers that can help you follow that, you, the sky's the limit on what kids will retain and how, how good they will feel about what they learn. So I see that happening more and more and more. And now that we have so much ability to, to research, um, you know, what works in learning and, and, and what doesn't, we'll see it over and over again that this is, this is the way. We just really are ahead of the curve. <laughs> Yeah, I think you really are. And Pat, I'd love to get your thoughts too, because, you know, there are so many of these small schools, micro schools that are emerging across the country. I interview these education entrepreneurs and school founders um, all the time. And I wonder, you know, do you think this is free school movement 2.0 and that there will be some fading? Or do you think that we're really just on the cusp of a growth in alternative education models? I think that that part that you just said is the given, that it's always right there. And for the person who sees it right there and who thinks, oh, well, this could be different and I could still be learning. For that person and that opportunity, that's where each individual growth spurt occurs. And if people who do education as a way of life were a little looser in the stomach and a little less concerned that, oh, yeah, well, you let kids do what they want and they're just going to kick off every day. They're just going to sit in front of the computer. They're just going to. Maybe they will. You're right, but not all the time. And if you're willing to go that mile there, that, yeah, all she did was sit in front of that computer for half a week. But then came a moment when she thought, well, this isn't getting me anywhere, or this is boring, or whatever. Allow that to occur, and off it will take on its own. We have to trust each other. And we especially have to trust our children, especially have to trust our children. And so when we do, we're going to see all these spurts, we're going to see all this advance. And we're going to know that we caused that. We allowed that to happen. That's the greatest joy. So Pat, as, as I kind of wrap up with our final question, I'd love to hear your advice uh, to aspiring school founders, uh, folks who might be listening, who want to start a small school and follow in your footsteps. 
um, after doing this for more than 50 years and launching at a time um, when you didn't know what the future would be like for Clunlara, what advice do you have for someone just dipping their toes into education, entrepreneurship? Do it. Great, great advice. Yes, do it, right? I mean, that's what I hear so often from founders too, is, is take the leap. Uh, and there, you know, 50 years of progress has proven that there's a model for what you're doing and that there can be long-term success for these other founders as well. So the website is clunlara.org. I'd encourage uh, all of my listeners and viewers to visit the website and consider Clunlara for children who are interested in an off-campus personalized educational model. And I'm just so thrilled to have had the opportunity to talk with you both today, uh, again, at the 30th anniversary of securing homeschooling rights in the state of Michigan, uh, thanks to you, Pat Montgomery. So Pat Montgomery and Chanda Montgomery Nickel, thank you so much for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thank you, Carrie, thank for you. having us. It's really wonderful to talk to you.